Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1978 Australian horror film Patrick. And I knew nothing about this film uh, until I saw it on Shudder and I read the little descriptor and I was like, ooh, that sounds kind of interesting. And then I started digging into it for research and I found out uh, Quentin Tarantino was a fan of this film and he actually used a portion of the film, a very uh, often cited scene in the film at the end of it. Uh, in one in his fil film Kill Bill, so I was like, oh, that's cool. Uh, Quentin Tarantino likes it. It must be at least somewhat good, and it is good. It's it's a fun time. If you've not ever seen it, you should definitely see it. There will be spoilers in this review because it's an older film, so I would just say if you haven't seen it yet, just stop here, go watch it, and then come back, and I'm going to break it down and talk about what I thought. Uh, it's directed by Richard Franklin, who then went on to do Psycho 2 because of this film. He got a lot of good attention from Hollywood. Uh, he also directed the film Cloak and Dagger and a film called World of Sexual Fantasy, which that one was actually before uh, Patrick, so just know that. I, I don't know what that is specifically, but I thought it was interesting to include. It was written by Everett DeRoche, who wrote the scripts for Razorback, Road Games, and Harlequin, just to name a few. Uh, Susan Penhaligon, Penhaligon, Haligon or Haligon, I don't know. Penhaligon or Haligon, I don't know. She was, she's was she been in a bunch of stuff. She has a lot of IMDb credits, and she did a really good job in this film. She's the titular character of Kathy, and she did nicely. She's been in uh, some episodes of The Old Doctor Who. She was also in The Land That Time Forgot. The Confessional, and The Uncanny. Also doing a great job in this, Robert Helpman, who played Dr. Roger in this. I thought he was very, very good for that role. Uh, he was in films such as Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and Don Quixote. And he also did another version of Don Quixote. Uh, I think it was just that Don Quixote Man of La Mancha. So, yeah. So the budget for this film was $400,000, but keep in mind that was in 1978. So... It, it would be higher nowadays. I don't have the conversion on that, but it would be higher. This was DeRoche's second script he ever made, period, or he ever wrote, period. And he said that Franklin, uh, the director, actually helped him a lot in kind of tightening the film up, um, or the script up for the film. It was like a 250-page script, which if people don't know, like, what they say for the rule, the rule on conversion of pages of script to minutes of film, it's like one page per minute, basically. So a 250 minute about film was not going to be good. So obviously that had to get cut down. Franklin apparently helped him greatly in cutting it down and taught him, he, he said, has said, taught him a lot about creating suspense in a film. And they actually started with the kind of end sequence of the film uh, where Patrick jumps out of bed and moved backwards in the script from that to kind of build the tension properly m moving up to, or making it up to that point. So I thought that was a really cool piece of trivia. Um, Robert Helpman, the guy who played Dr. Roger, broke his back trying to lift up Robert, Tom Robert Thompson, who was Patrick, in one of the actual scenes where he was trying to move him. Um, that's messed up. That sucks. It's just a reminder that, you know, safety on a set is a big thing. And safety now is way better than it used to be back then. But things still happen. So people be careful. The film was a flop in Australia, unfortunately. But it sold really well internationally and did really well internationally. And it ended up selling to over 30 countries outside of Australia. So it did quite well. Obviously, like I said, it garnered the attention of... Uh, Quentin Tarantino many decades later and he incorporated that final scene into well final ish scene into Kill Bill which is cool uh, and a remake of the film was actually released in Australia in 2013 and it had mostly positive reviews for it so just thought I'd throw that in there so the very beginning of this film the kind of noises that you're hearing in the dark and then going to the eyeballs opening uh, is really, really interesting, and obviously the eyeballs being Patrick's. I think that's a really cool way to kind of start because he's hearing things throughout the film, obviously. Uh, even though at one point they say that all his senses, like they theorize that all his senses are gone. He's like totally comatose, a vegetable, basically. That's why they end up calling Kathy the, a gardener, because uh, she's tending to the vegetable. But she... Um, but he, starting like that, it's interesting because it's dark and you're just hearing the noises of like cars outside. 
And it's cool because that's the experience of what Patrick would be experiencing throughout the film, most likely. Um, although, I don't know if he actually does see. There's kind of some, they leave it vague as, as to whether he actually sees things throughout it because his eyes are kind of permanently open and they do say that they need to keep them lubricated. So I'd assume that he doesn't really, but we don't know for sure in this, but... Uh, so basically what you would assume he's hearing all the time, like that's his main sense that's still there. And then it goes to him opening his eyes, which is just a cool visual and it's very creepy. And then obviously you get that whole scene that sets everything up really of his mom, you know, having sex with some guy I assume is not her, her, uh, not his father. And that's where, you know, everything really starts for Patrick of really, well, Within the film, that's where everything starts for Patrick, but I'm assuming there's a lot of backstory to that of bad, having a bad relationship with his mom and feeling like he wants his mom just to himself, basically, but she has multiple suitors. That's kind of what it uh, says to me, that, that one scene. And it's a crazy, brutal scene where he goes in and ends up murdering his mother and her lover in the, in their, um, in the bathtub. Uh, I didn't think it would be as graphic as it was, but it was relatively graphic, and it looked really good. They shot it really well. Uh, you know, her hair catching on fire, like the burn on her back from the heater that was thrown in. And then they don't show the actual electrocution portion, but they do a good job of really alluding to it and making it kind of vivid in your own mind of filling in that blank. Um, so a really good way to start it out. Uh, and I felt it was brutal. The job interview that they, that they then go to uh, for Kathy to get this job, you know, looking after Patrick, uh, is really funny and weird because uh, Matron Cassidy is just, like, throwing all these weird accusations at her about, like, saying, are you a pervert? Are you into this, 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 this? And then just basically saying that for some reason this type of job just tends to attract perverts in essence. And she talks about, like, necrophiliacs. And people are, who are into all sorts of crazy sexual stuff. Um, that's a weird interview. And I just thought it, it was, it's quirky in the film, but it's also weird. And I think it kind of sets the tone of just a odd work environment. So it's, it works in that sense. It's weird. Uh, because it's a weird work environment. And a lot of personalities at that pl place of business are very weird too. Dr. Roger, Matron Cassidy, very strong personalities, very weird people. Um, their motives are very odd too, or motivations. Uh, they lay down a lot of dialogue in this, especially early, ex uh, explaining how incapable Patrick is when he's first introduced to the audience and to Kathy, and that he has like no chance to recover. You know, he can't see or hear anything. He's totally a vegetable. He's basically dead, but his body's alive. Dr. Roger even says that early on that he's not really alive. The machine is, the machine's keeping him there. So they really, really hammer that home, and the, obviously the main reason for that is to make it even more of a shock much later in the film for the audience when first, when uh, Patrick, you know, starts doing things with his mind, and then when he's communicating via the typewriter, which is an extremely effective way for him to communicate. It looks really cool, it's very effective, and it's creepy at the same time. Uh, and then also when he, you know, eventually turns and looks at, uh, at the, uh, I forget the other one's name. Um, what was the other nurse's name? I can't remember her name. The one who be ended up becoming basically catatonic after he actually picked his head up and looked at her. And then the final thing where he basically, you know, throws himself out of bed, which I'll talk a little bit about that later. The theory of, you know, what is it? It's a little vague. Um, Plenty of people will not like the frog scene in this film, me included. I never, never like to see animals being killed or abused with film or hearing about it because it's very unnecessary. You know, I understand this was a different time and that was kind of, you know, more something that was not frowned upon as much and just done then. But it's always just terrible to see and it's still inexcusable in my opinion, even if it was more accepted, acceptable back then because you're killing something just for a scene in a film. It just doesn't make any sense. But I understand that it was a different time. And I'm very glad that we've moved past that and become much better about it. So now we can do a CGI frog if we did a remake of it. 
Three years is a long time to keep Patrick alive just to document what happens when he dies because that's what Dr. Roger says he's going to do. And they may not even catch what happens. That's the other thing. Like, there's kind of some, I understand it's that he's doing, like, tests and he's, you know, monitoring and, every, and everything. But he kind of says that his end goal is to catch the moment and, and you know, document what happens when he actually dies. And, you know, is there a soul that leaves his body or whatever? But do you know that that'll be caught? Because, yes, I know that there's someone always with him. And that's what Kathy's there to do. But... They do things, you know, they're not always there, you know, someone's got to go to the bathroom at some point, you know, they may be turned around doing something in the room, like it's not guaranteed, so this kind of seems like a dumb experiment, but it works for the film, so just saying. What a weird scene when Ed acts like he's going to rape Kathy. Oh my gosh, that is like an insane scene that I don't understand why you would have it. And then the fact that she basically shrugs it off, that her that her soon-to-be ex-husband, they're separating, uh, breaks into her apartment, acts like he's going to rape her, and then she even says that he's been stalking her and won't leave her alone, and the conversation between them does not match what's going on there. Uh, they just kind of like laugh it off, and they're still jovial and cordial with each other, and it's very weird. It, it, it's... It's not very true to life, even back then. So that portion is very odd, very poorly written. And I don't like that portion of the film because it just doesn't feel realistic at all. It's, it's, it's a bad portion of it. But I understand that they were kind of doing that to set up the sequence where, you know, people would believe that it wasn't Patrick doing anything when, especially when Kathy's house gets ransacked, but it was Ed because, you know, he had broken in before and that's just the thing he did and he's been stalking her and all that stuff. So I understand why they did it, but it's just a weird way to do it. The combination of the opening scene and when you first see Patrick use telekinesis, which is to open the windows in his room, sends the message that he can kill with his mind because he's mentally capable because he already killed in the opening scene his mother of all people, so he's definitely capable of killing and willing to do it, and that he's telekinetically gifted, which we end up finding out later the theory of that Ed has, I believe, that, I think it was Ed has it, um, the theory that even though, you know, he has no senses at some point, he's in this comatose state, so then he ends up basically developing himself and working out how to have telekinesis that it's not like a gift he was born with that it's something he developed himself over those three years of being in that comatose state so kind of giving the idea that anyone potentially could develop that if they're smart enough or if they figure out how to do it um, so that was kind of an interesting aspect of it the added element of Patrick being able to use his powers outside of the room he's physically in opens up a lot of possibilities and makes the danger way more intense. Also, when you find out that additional step that takes it to another level, that he can kind of mind control people. And it seems like it's not mind controlling for long periods of time. It seems kind of more short periods of time. Kind of like, you know, when he was, especially at the end, trying to make Cal Kathy inject herself with the potassium chloride. Or, you know, a smaller thing where he's, you know, making her type things out on the typewriter as she was doing it. Um... Yeah. Oh, well, and also when Ed, when he made Ed just like hold that really um, hot piece of cookware so that he burned his hands. So those things really ratchet up the danger. They ratchet up the suspense. They make the audience realize this guy is not just dangerous. He's crazy dangerous. And like I said before, he's already killed and he killed his own mother. So he won't hesitate most likely. It becomes obvious that Patrick will only let Kathy know his secret because he likes her and she treats him like an actual person. And that becomes very clear because everyone's pretty cold to him. They treat him as persona non grata, as like he's not even human. They call him a vegetable. They say he's basically dead. But she comes in and she has this different thought on it. And she has this spin that there's got to be something going on. And I think that because she's so warm to him, because she gives him the benefit of the doubt and she treats him like an actual person that he starts to really like her. And it makes me wonder if that was what happened also with the one, uh, with the nurse before her, that we later find out he killed the boyfriend of from the sergeant when he tells that to Kathy on the phone. 
which is a really cool moment in, in that reveal because that makes things like oh you know this she's not unique this isn't the first time something like this has happened so i assume that that person and kathy were kind of similar in how they treated him you clearly see patrick's jealousy getting stronger as he tries to drown brian in the pool and messes up kathy's house that's kind of really ratcheting things up and it's effective uh, Dr. Roger shows his true colors as a bad human being when he proposes to make basically shock responses out of Patrick. So for that reason, I think he's kind of set up as this kind of this mad scientist, this unethical, well, immoral person, and that he um, will go to whatever lengths to get the information he's looking for. He does obviously doesn't look at Patrick as a feeling human being. It's a chilling moment when Kathy or when Patrick makes Kathy type out the words "How's your boyfriend?" That was an awesome moment, really really chilling, and once again, the typewriter being the way that he communicates works very well, especially for that. Uh, there's a really cool exchange in this in this film when Kathy says it's not fair, and then I think it's Brian says in response, "But it's ethical," kind of raising the concern that. Certain things that don't seem fair, don't seem moral, can be considered technically ethical within the medical realm. And one of those things that they kind of hammer home in this film being keeping people alive, which I think it's Matron Cassidy who basically says that, uh, you know, modern medicine isn't um, keeping people, they're not prolonging, prolonging people's life, they're just staving off death basically which is not a good thing so uh the cuts between patrick's meter and matron cassidy going to shut off the power is really well done it really does a good job of kind of keeping tension and slowly moving it up much like the uh needle on his meter and then it culminating in when he actually moves and that nurse like flips out uh, why is Dr. Roger so angry and defensive when the sergeant comes to talk about the power failure? It's weird. It doesn't seem like he would actually be like that. I guess maybe he's just protective of his business, uh, that he feels like, oh no, I don't know, like like he's offended if, if it somehow had to do with them. I, I don't, I don't know. It didn't really make sense to me why he was so defensive. Showing Ed stuck in the elevator all that time later was very, very effective because you assume initially when the elevator opens and he looks at it that he's going to get into it and then something's going to happen to him. But then they don't do anything with that scene and you assume, oh, okay, I guess he just didn't get into the elevator. But then you realize when they finally show him in the elevator again, like tens of minutes later, that... um oh yeah, we never saw what happened with him, and oh my gosh, he's stuck in the elevator. And then you think, he's been in the elevator that long. That's terrible and scary. And uh, what else does Patrick have in store for him? So yeah. Uh, the sergeant giving Kathy that information about the nurse was great, about her, you know, Patrick having killed, well, she makes the connection of Patrick having killed another nurse's boyfriend, but that's good, good reveal. Um, real effective jump scare at the end, obviously. It mirrors what happened with the frog that's shown earlier, but Patrick is actually still alive, as we see when he opens his eyes at the very, very end. But that raises a question. Did he, with his telekinesis, manipulate the heart monitor to make people think that he was dead? I don't know. Uh, that's just a, just a theory. I'm thinking that's probably what happened. There was a real scientific phase for uh, some decades ago about looking, uh, having to do with looking at the what the brain was capable of, and I think this kind of plays a bit off that idea with the whole telekinesis thing going on. So I, I think it was a good concept. I like how they incorporated it. There's also a point about medicine doing the opposite of what it claims. I kind of talked about it a little bit, you know, staving off death versus actually prolonging life, which the ideal would be prolonging life. And what it's actually doing is just staving off death. So people are living in these terrible states and it brings up this question of quality of life, which I think that kind of dialogue that people should be having is effective now, especially when things come up about like assisted suicide being available to people who, you know, maybe have a terminal illness and they really don't want to live anymore because their existence is so painful that they'd rather not exist. Uh, but, you know, the code of ethics for, medicine is to 
keep that body going as long as possible, even though there might not be any quality of life. So I think it's still pertinent. And then the last thing I'd say is it goes with the idea of nature, uh, uh, I'm sorry, nurture or the lack thereof being responsible for turning someone bad. Obviously that in the case of Patrick, because his mom not being a good mother, as it's alluded to, uh, kind of, they're basically saying, sets him up to be a killer, to be sadistic, to do these types of things to people. So um, that's all I have to say about Patrick. I'm really glad I watched it. Uh, I think, I, I don't, I could see myself rewatching. It's very interesting. It's a little bit long because it's like two hours and 50 some minutes and I, you know, it kind of drags from time to time, but overall pretty good. I enjoyed it. And, uh, with a possibility of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to give it a very solid three and a half star rating. I enjoyed it. So Anyway, uh, thanks everyone for checking this out. Let's talk in the comments about Patrick. Did you see it and what were your thoughts about it? Let's uh, get nerdy. Uh, but do me a quick favor, hit that subscribe button because that's your best way to repay me for all the videos I put out. If you like even one video I've done, please consider just subscribing because it means a lot to me. I really appreciate it. And it's literally a taking a second for you to do. But if you are gonna do that or you already have, also, make sure you hit the notification bell. That way you know whenever I'm putting up a new video or when I'm doing a live stream or anything like that. But regardless, I appreciate you taking this time to watch this video. And until next time, keep it brutal.